Hello, everyone. Welcome to Asian Novel Seminar, hosted by Arthroplasty Society of Asia. This program is designed to establish a professional arthroplasty forum that joint surgeons from all over the world can be connected to share their personal ideas, clinical experience, and cutting-edge technologies. I'm Wen Liang from Beijing Chaoyang Hospital, Capital Medical University. I'm honored to moderate today's discussion. In today's program, we will focus on some new element methods and novel technology in total neosurplasty. Total neosurplasty experienced its greatest development in 1970s, with mechanical element becoming the gold standard. But since then, although various new processes more precise implant tools or new technologies have emerged. Unfortunately, there has not been a milestone progress which significantly improved the post-operative outcome of total neosoplasty under the preconditions of mechanical alignment. It's interesting that fewer and fewer knee surgeons are stiffly sticking to the three-point line post-operative HK alignment. Instead, more and more knee surgeons are focusing on restoration of native joint line, less soft tissue interference, and higher patient satisfaction. In today's seminar, we're honored to have three highly experienced and renowned experts in the field of artificial knee joints. They are Professor Stephen miller Howe from a biomechanical department of the University of California, Davis. He is a leading expert and pioneer in kinematically aligned total knee osteoplasty technique. Welcome, you, Professor Hop. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen. And Professor Huang Wei from the first affiliated hospital of Chongqing Medical School. Hello, yeah. And Professor Zhang Guoqiang, he comes from a Chinese PLA General Hospital in Beijing. Welcome, you, Professor Zhang. In the following one hour seminar, three experts will fully discuss some controversial issues that we are concerned about. I will take a few questions of general interest from a knee society for three lectures. Let's move on to the topic discussion. The topic one is the issue of a safe boundary of alignment parameters after total neosoplasty. Of the surgical technique introduced by three professors in this room, no one stiffly stick to the traditional three-point line of post-operative HK alignment and tibia cut, nor tibia cut perpendicular to mechanical axis. In the absence of the application of me mechanical alignment technology, Theoretically speaking, there is no concept of male alignment, but the deviation to neutral alignment cannot be expanded without limit. So what's the safe boundary of HKA and MPTA after total neosplasty, in your opinion? How about your opinion, Professor Hao? Well, I think you have to understand that when you look at kinematic alignment, the rules are different. When you look at mechanical alignment, the rules are different from kinematic alignment. So when I look at a knee, my goal is to restore the patient's pre-arthritic alignment. So that's the boundary. Yes. And if I'm more varus or valgus from the patient's pre-arthritic joint line, then I am outside what I would consider to be a safe boundary. I don't look at the hip ankle angle or the proximal tibial angle, or the distal femoral angle postoperatively to see if it's within a bound. My target is, does it match the opposite side? It's a philosophical difference. So I think it's a, the problem that people have when they look at kinematic alignment is they try to blend it. They try to decide, well, how far will I go based on my mechanical alignment experience? With kinematic alignment, we have different rules. We don't take a preoperative long leg of the limb. We don't really take one afterwards anymore. You can just get x-rays of the knee and just check the angles if you want. The real check with kinematic alignment is 
does the caliper measurement of the bone resections from the femur match that of the patient's pre-arthritic knee when you base it off the implant thickness? And when it does, you are within a safe boundary. When you're outside that, then you're outside a safe boundary. So patients or doctors or surgeons that predict that do restricted kinematic alignment are not really doing it. They're doing expanded mechanical alignment. And that I think has a possibility of problems because you don't then balance the knee correctly. If you want to get rid of varus tibial loosening, the solution to that is calipered kinematic alignment in the unrestricted technique. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hao. Uh, thank you for your opinion and uh, explanation. Uh, how about your opinion, Dr. Huang, uh, Professor Huang? Okay, yeah. Just like you said, maybe there is low sensors, but uh, according to uh, the professor, the article, and maybe according to the the uh, implants, the biomechanicals, I think that maybe it's close to perpendicular to the the article. Maybe is bad is better is better because. If there is a severe virus, maybe I think um, just like maybe uh, Professor Hall, maybe I, I just say maybe, maybe it's easy to uh, lose. Maybe so. I think maybe the the angle, maybe just uh, say the self boundary angle, maybe uh, is close to three three degrees uh, deviation is good. It's better. Okay, three degrees. Okay, thank yeah. you, Dr. Fang. How about your opinion, uh, Professor Zhang? Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, this uh, this concept of uh, self boundary is just belong to the uh, mechanical alignment. Yes. So that's the uh, how uh, Professor Howell said. Uh, if you want to uh, talk about the uh, uh, kinetic alignment, uh, you can throw away out of the of the safe boundary because the KA is no safe boundary, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but I, in my, in my practice, I just still uh, follow uh, the, the, the philosophy of the uh, mechanical alignment. But, but in recent years, I just, uh, uh, a little bit of change. So I don't, I won't uh, focus on the neutral alignment, just a zero alignment. I just uh, 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 set the the HKA a little a little bit mild a mild virus. Just uh, uh, Professor Huang said, maybe uh, three degrees virus uh, is is good. So okay. I think the uh, safe boundary. It's just uh, less than uh, three uh, three uh, degree, but if I use the robot total knee arthroplasty, maybe I will I will enlarge this boundary. Maybe I will set less than five degree mild uh, virus, mild virus degree. This is my okay. opinion. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, let's move on to the second topic. That's an issue on patient selection. As we all know, appropriate selection of appropriate cases is the key to successful surgery. So what's the selection criteria for knee osteoarthritis patient for your technique, as described earlier? Namely, what kind of OA patients without ligamentous dysfunction will you not choose for the technique in primary TKA? Uh, Professor Hao, maybe this topic you have uh, gave the ex ex explanation in your presentation, right? Yeah, so currently I have done since 2006 over 6,000 uh, unrestricted kinematically aligned cases consecutive. So we just follow the rules and restore the joint lines. When I used to think the MCL contracted on the medial side and the varus knee, I used to th think that the lateral collateral ligament stretched in the varus knee, and then the reverse in the valgus knee. And as you do more and more of these, you realize that really those ligaments generally don't stretch. Uh, and so assuming that that's the case, you can you don't have to really worry about the ligaments because they're not dysfunction, including the PCL. Now you do have patients when the PCL is torn and then you have to do kinematic alignment. I will then in that case, 
maybe take two millimeters more off the distal femur to put in a little more plastic so that I get better stability and flexion. Because often I found I would stuff plastic to tighten the flexion space when the PCL was missing. And then you could lose a little bit of extension of the knee. So when I have a chronic PCL deficiency, I'm thinking maybe I'll take another two millimeters off the distal femur to balance the knee a little bit better. If you truly have a ligamentous disruption, or if by mistake, we cut the MCL in the operating room, which has happened a couple of times to me, then we do calipered kinematic alignment, we just add constraint to the implant. So we just put a more constrained component in, but it still goes in kinematically and the joint lines are still restored. So we do calipered kinematic alignment in everybody, whether the ligaments are functioning or not, we just add constraint when we need to, to compensate for the ligaments. And one final point, in all those years, I have never used a stem extension on a patient. So okay. obese patients, to the mechanical alignment surgeon, I'm cutting in varus. I usually undersize the base plate because I need to fit it within the cortical rim. I don't butter the back of the tibial base plate when I cement it. I cement it right on the bone. And I start closing the knee before the cement's completely set. And we have not seen varus loosening. Our problem is all sagittal plane from not matching the slope, where we'll find that the tibial component will subside posteriorly. If the slope's too great, the patient loads the back of the plastic and either it subsides or you get wear and it spins out. So our problems with KA are not coronal, sagittal plane. Too much, too little slope causes problems on the tibial side. Too much flexion of the femoral component can cause tracking problems. So sagittal control is what we need to do with kinematic alignment. The, the coronal plane is solved by restoring the patient's prearthritic joint line. That is our safe boundary. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor Hao. Uh, how about your opinion, Professor Huang? Is there any restriction for you to choose your patient in your technique? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, just like you said, maybe in the past, uh, uh, in China, my, uh, for me, I always choose uh, the maybe the MA is good, but uh, in recent uh, several years, Maybe we always study from the professor how well. Maybe for the for the ordinary the patients, we always choose maybe uh, do some uh, close to maybe restricted the KA. Maybe is uh, appropriate to the uh, patients. The anatomical structure is good, but for some severe the deformed patients. But I think I, I think it's a little different with uh, Professor Howell. But I think maybe for most of the severe deformed patients, maybe they always have the congenital uh, uh, developmental deformity, such as the, the bone and the soft tissue. So for this kind of the patient, maybe I think if for me, maybe I do some uh, soft tissue release is, is good uh, to get the better balance. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. How about you, Professor Zhang? In my, in my opinion, I just proposed the, the, the new concept of, uh, of the, the medial restoration. Uh, maybe this concept is similar as some uh, professor Hall's opinion a little bit. Uh, some some uh, some opinions is similar with uh, Professor Hao, uh, uh, but I just uh, uh, I just uh, restore the medial side of the femur and the tibia. So I don't care about the uh, lateral side more too much. So uh, this concept just a candidate for. Uh, all patient with uh, with uh, osteoarthritis, uh, including virus de deformity, uh, later uh, uh, valgus valgus knee. Uh, so uh, all the patient can use this uh, concept. Mm, good, good. Thank you, thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, let's move on to the third topic, the issue on soft tissue release. In each professor's lecture, you all mentioned the need to avoid the soft tissue release as much as possible and the resulting benefit for patients. 
So in what percentage of the patient you choose for the technique mentioned earlier, is soft tissue not necessary to be used? And under what circumstances will you have to do soft tissue release? Professor Hall? Well, that's uh, when I go back to 2006, when I started doing one KA knee out of three total knees in a day, and I did that till we built the ability to do it in every patient. What shocked me was where I thought I would have a tight ligament, I didn't. And the message I'm going to give you is a simple one. If you think you need to release a ligament, then your components are in, to use the word crooked, from the patient's pre-arthritic joint lines. So when you're stuck with a very tight ligament, what I do is I take my four femoral bone resections and I measure them again. And I check them. And I look at my slope off the tibial cut and I look to see if the medial and lateral resections are about the same thickness. I put the knee in extension with the spacer block and see that I have very negligible varus valgus laxi in full extension because if I do have laxity, it means I didn't cut the varus valgus cut of the tibia right, and I'll fine-tune it. So the take-home message, when you're doing unrestricted caliper kinematic alignment, if you do one ligament release out of 500 knees a year, you're probably doing too many. Mm, okay, I understand. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, how about your opinion, Professor Huang? Yeah, uh, maybe, I think maybe... In my opinion, maybe now is uh, less, uh, less than the 10% uh, uh, patients needed to do the soft tissue release. But maybe just like uh, the professor Howell said, maybe just uh, he always, just uh, for the severe patient, he always do the measurement of the uh, resection of the tibia or the, the femoral condyl. But for me, maybe with the navigation or the bots, before the operation, we always design with the soft tissue, uh, soft the wear, and uh, we can check where is uh, uh, get the better the uh, gap balance. In that way, I think I I do not need to uh, do soft tissue release. But usually, if I do my manual, I, I like to use the gap resection uh, 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 technique. Okay. Okay. I'm very glad, uh, I'm very glad to hear that uh, nearly 90% in your hand do not have to do the soft related, right, Professor Wang? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How about your uh, opinion, Professor Zhang? Uh, since I use uh, medial restoration concept, I performed uh, total knee arthroplasty. Uh, I perform uh, soft tissue release less and less. Hardly, uh, hardly uh, uh, release the soft tissue. Uh, just, uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, Professor Howell said, uh, I uh, put more work on the bone cutting for example i will i will adjust the the tibial slope to balance the uh, extension and the flexion uh, the gap and uh, i will i will uh, adjust the various uh, the uh, the various uh, osteotomy of the tib uh, tibia to uh, to meet with the extension uh, the 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 lateral and the medial uh, gap balance. So the top, top, uh, soft tissue is especially the MCL. I hardly uh, uh, release it. Okay, thank you, thank you, all the three experts. Uh, as for the third topic, it seems that we can we can come into a consensus that uh, the soft tissue soft tissue is very important, and uh, we will try to keep it intact as possible as we can. In order to understand more specifically the technologies and alignment method, I prepared some representative cases and I would like to hear the opinion from three experts in this room with their own ideas. Okay, let's turn to the section of a case discussion. 
the first two cases is a uh, virus knee, the left knee, and uh, you can from the parameters we can see the patient have a deviant MPTA with probably bone wear. My question is, how will you make your collaborative plan in your technique, Dr. Hao? Well, um, when you become, when you fully switch your thinking to uh, kinematic alignment, and I think when you so-called get it, the operative plan is made as soon as you look at the patient's knee when they stand in front of you. So when I look at this patient's knee, I know that my distal medial cut will be six, my distal lateral cut will be eight, and my posterior cuts will be seven. And I don't need a radiograph to know that. Now, I will check it, of course. That's my plan. But when I open the knee, like when the dentist puts the crown on the tooth, I am going to carefully examine that articular surface of the femur. And as I mentioned, this patient probably has a pretty good flexion contraction. So at zero, where I'm going to put my distal referencing guide down to set proximal distal and varus valgus, the bone is intact. And if I'm missing cartilage, I'll back build two millimeters with an offset on the guide, and I'll set my cut and make that. If this patient had chronic ACL insufficiency, yes. then you may have complete cartilage loss posterior medial. Generally, if the ACL is intact, the wear on the medial side goes around about 70 to 80 degrees, but not to 90. So flex the knee up as far as you can, take your knife, poke the cartilage. And if you're missing cartilage, then when you put your zero degree posterior referencing guide in, you need to accommodate for the cartilage missing by putting a little shim on your posterior referencing guide of two millimeters. And so the radiograph and all these angles, I never make anymore. In fact, I don't think I've put an x-ray up in the operating room when I did a to went to do a total knee in a decade because the information is in front of your eyes as soon as you open the knee. It's a different philosophy, and it's hard to grasp when you're used to doing this all the time. But once again, if I was to plan the knee, instead of having HKLA and MPTA and JCLA and so forth, I would put DM, distal medial cut, six, uh, distal lateral cut, eight, Posterior medial cut seven, posterior lateral cut seven, check for cartilage wear. That's what I would have for my plan on the femur. And then when I cut the tibia, I want the varus valgus cut to be such that when the knee's in full extension, there's no varus valgus laxity when I passively move the knee with a spacer block. If the medial side opens, I need to cut more valgus. If the lateral side opens, I need to cut more varus. And then I double check it again with my trial components in full extension at about 15 to 30. And at 30, the medial side should open a millimeter or so, and the lateral side, two to three to four. And that's the normal laxity and the flexion space that you see because the extension space is rectangular in everybody. But once you flex, the extension space becomes trapezoidal and the amount of lateral medial open varies from patient to patient. And you know this when you arthroscope knees, it's sometimes easier to take a medial meniscus out in one person than another, and the lateral is always easier to take out than medial. So from a calipered kinematic alignment technique, we want to restore and maintain the patient's native soft tissue envelope, which is their native tight rectangular extension space and trapezoidal flexion space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howell, for explaining the detail of your preoperative plan. How about your opinion, Professor Huang? Uh, did you will feel uh, do you feel pain? Uh, uh, do you feel difficult to make the preoperative plan uh, in such a patient? But before the operation, I always do some of the soft tissue examination, just like MCL and LCL. Maybe the function is good. It is uh, convertible the deformed. So I just use a uh, restricted MA technique, but uh, usually use the tibia band is uh, perpendicular to the headquart and uh, the femoral uh, abduction angle maybe is close to the five or six. I, I should measure the angles. Just this is uh, always use the MA technique. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Huang. 
Uh, let's move to the Professor John. Uh, do you think it's uh, it's uh, difficult to to restore the middle structure in such a patient in your philosophy? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, this patient is very. Uh, this kind of patient is very common seen in China. So, uh, so uh, just be, because my uh, my my philosophy of the medial uh, restoration just uh, uh, a little bit similar and the professor how so I just want to ask some questions uh, to uh, to professor how uh, just like this uh, this patient. They have uh, some uh, some bone wear on the femoral side and tibial side. How to evaluate uh, uh, the thickness of the uh, bone wear and the cartilage is uh, how how many uh, thickness do you uh, plan to restore? So I can uh, send you, we have a paper, uh, I think the first author is NOM, where we looked at a large number of MRIs in very severe OA knees. Yeah. To look for where the bone wear was and how much cartilage thickness there was. So as I said, because a, a severe varus knee doesn't fully extend, they walk with it flexed. At zero degrees on the femur, there's negligible bone wear. So that is very helpful unless you had a prior infection or an osteochondral defect, but 99.9% .9 you can take to the bank that there's no bone loss at zero and 90. So just build out where the cartilage is missing. And certainly someone could argue, well, someone might have a three millimeter thick cartilage in one and a half, but we just picked two just because it's a practical number. And that's the mean value that we had from examining all these patients. Now, what you'll notice here is you've got a large medial osteophyte on the femur that you're going to take away. You've got a medial osteophyte on the tibia, which you're going to take away, which will then, if you will, slacken the medial collateral ligament and allow you to open it. So how much correction will you get at the ankle? It turns out for every millimeter you shim the medial side apart, you move the ankle over, depending on the length of the tibia, but a typical tibia, six millimeters. So imagine we get two millimeters of cartilage on the femur. Let's say we get three millimeters of cartilage on the tibia for five, and maybe there's a millimeter to a bone loss there. So let's say we get seven. So seven times six is 42 millimeters. That means this patient's ankle is going to move 42 millimeters lateral from where it currently is. And that's what corrects the deformity. So we're correcting the deformity not to zero, but back to where the patient was when he was 20 or 30 years old before he got arthritic. So every millimeter you shim in a compartment moves the ankle six millimeters away from the deformity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hao and uh, Dr. Zhang. Let's move to the uh, second case. So you can see from the parameters, especially the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, we can see that uh, this patient have a constitutional valgus alignment before the onset of the osteoarthritis. So in such a valgus knee, how do you plan the post-operative post -operative alignment in your technique? That's a choice, neutral or keep valgus alignment? Or what's your opinion, Dr. Hao? Well, this is just a reverse of the varus knee. So, but what is different in the valgus knee is usually there's not a lot of cartilage wear from zero to 30 or 40 degrees in the lateral femoral condyle because those patients walk in flexion as well. And so many times you don't have to do any correction on that distal cut when there's cartilage present. So I would say that I would be prepared just thinking about it to make my two distal medial distal lateral cuts would be eight at a millimeter back for the uh, thickness of the curve to get nine for the implant. You have to be careful though, that in the valgus knee, they wear more posteriorly than the varus knee. So I will definitely take that knee in the operating room, make sure I remove the lateral meniscus as best I can with a cautery so I can get way in the back, flex the knee up, take a knife, poke the cartilage overlying the 90 degree position of the femoral condyle. And if there's cartilage missing, I will build out the posterior resection two millimeters with a shim so that I restore the patient's prearthritic posterior joint line. 
So once again, the radiographs are really of no interest to me other than to be sure that there's not hardware in there or some big bone defect. I just got to look at the knee. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about you, choice, Professor Huang? Valgus or natural? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I, uh, for this kind of patient, just like the Howell, Professor Howell, uh, this maybe looks like a, a slight uh, osteoarthritis. So for this kind of kind of the patient, I think maybe the anatomical structure is almost uh, uh, is uh, getting the normal. So I always do close to the natural. Okay, okay. How about your opinion, Professor Zhang? Yes, I agree with uh, Professor Huang. For the valgus knee, I prefer uh, correcting the deformity to the neutral alignment, even a little bit various, <laughs> various degree. I won't leave uh, any valgus uh, deformity uh, for the patient because I have a failure of cases uh, who had some degree of valgus uh, degree uh, deformity uh, residue. So uh, this patient was uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and after operation, the residue uh, out valgus degree uh, aggravated. aggravated. Uh, gradually, so maybe uh, one year uh, post operation, I revised uh, the total knee arthroplasty for for her. So I prefer <laughs> correcting the deformity <laughs> neutral alignment. Okay, okay, thank you. And let's move on to, to the last case. It's, it's a case of a severe varus knee with flexion contracture. In such a patient, I my question is one routine bone cut and the removal of a posterior femur osteophy could not correct the flexion contracture. What do you do for the next step? Additional bone cut, self tissue release, or others? Dr. Hall? Yes, these are. Uh, this was another surprise for me that um, when we started doing KA, we would have uh, an easier time getting the knee straight and uh, I, you definitely have to go around back and get off those posterior osteophytes. So I keep posterior cruciate ligament. So because of that, I'm working medial and lateral to the hapsial posterior. And of course, when you take those osteophytes off posterior, you tend to strip a little bit of the posterior medial and lateral capsule off the femur. So knowing that means that I did not strip any capsule off the area that's directly posterior to the PCL. So when I know that my bone cuts are right, if I put my insert in, so let's say the spacer block inflection says it should be 11 millimeters thick, I'll start my trial with a 10 insert and I'll bring the knee in extension. And if it doesn't go to full extension, then I'll do a gentle manipulation, put my hand under the ankle and put my other hand anteriorly on the patella and just push it back and you'll feel a pop. And that's a plastic deformation. And that is, if you will, a soft tissue release, not of the PCL, not of the collaterals, but it's just a stretching of the posterior capsule that over time got contracted, much like a frozen shoulder does uh, in, in when you do a manipulation under anesthesia. And that will spring back. It's a plastic deformation. It doesn't recoil. And then you can continue with your trialing of your insert thicknesses to get the correct one. So, so for me, very common in these severe varus deformities or thalgus deformities of flesh contracture. Put your trials in, give it a little push, and that will stretch the capsule with a valgus knee, it's posterior lateral, and that brings it over out of valgus. So that's a little trick with the valgus knee is when you, when you have your cuts right, look at that tibia cut. If it looks good and in extension, the medial side's opening, and you're worried, oh, I've got to cut more valgus, don't. Put your trials in, give the knee a little push in extension, the posterior lateral capsule stretches and your knee gets out of the valgus orientation. Okay, that means uh, you will choose the posterior release, not but the not, but, but, yeah. but, but not, not surgically, done. just by a stretch. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay. See, just by pushing it. Okay. Just like massage. I'll send you a video. <laughs> <laughs> Push, yeah, yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, what's, what, what's you, what will you do next uh, for the next step? Uh, Professor Huang? Yeah, for this kind of the patient, I think maybe first I always do the close to the MA the uh, technique. But just uh, you said, uh, 
but uh, for this kind of paper, I think maybe it's not a real construction of the MCL. So when I do some um, finish a uh, part of the uh, bone resection, first I check the gap balance. If we get the uh, when when I do a uh, after the bone resection. I re remove all of this uh, osteophyte. I find it just a little uh, narrow uh, in the medial side. Maybe in this session, I I will move the tibial and femoral uh, processes uh, laterally. In that situation, maybe I can. I think maybe can uh, uh, resolve all of these problems. But uh, this sign that you cannot. Uh, 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 resolve this, uh, the, uh, vergers, uh, the, the vergers. So in this situation, I, maybe I will do two or three degrees vergers, uh, bone resections after I, maybe I, I can find uh, maybe the method to resolve the, the, uh, on 11, the, uh, uh, gap balance. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Huang. Uh, Professor Zhang, uh, will you do the additional uh, bone cut in the distal femur? Uh, actually, according my uh, according to my previous uh, previous uh, experience, I will recut the distal uh, distal femur without any hesitation. So, <laughs> but but now I I change. I won't do that directly. So, uh, firstly, I will make sure the posterior condyle uh, of the femur won't be overcut. Just just uh, Professor Hall side, I will add the cartilage thickness to uh, to the the total uh, the total thickness of the poster posterior uh, condyle, uh, especially medial condyle uh, resection. Uh, secondly, I will recheck the tibial slope and reduce the degree of the tibial slope. So I, I just want to uh, get the extent, full extension. And uh, then I will detect the medial posterior part of the tibial plateau. Generally, uh, there always, uh, always has a part of bone uncovered by, uh, uncovered by, uh, by the tibial, uh, tibial tree. So I will, I will remove the part of the medial posterior part, uh, 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 medial posterior plateau. So maybe this uh, this uh, procedure can release some 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 tension of the posterior con capsule. So uh, the last step, if the if the full extension uh, couldn't be uh, acquired, I will uh, recut the additional uh, femur. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you, all the three experts. Okay, I think it's time for a brief conclusion. Sorry, uh, sorry, Professor Wen. I just uh, want to ask some questions uh, to uh, Professor Hao because this is very uh, a good chance to... <laughs> okay, okay, no <laughs> to talk, problem. To talk okay. about the, 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 uh, the, the kin kinematic alignment. So okay. for for the kinematic alignment is a very new concept for me for for, for us. So uh, some papers stu uh, the study result just uh, indicated that uh, if you uh, perform the kinematic alignment, maybe the stress of the patella will be increasing. So what opinion about this? Yeah. So. <sighs> We've looked at the patella as others. There's been some good uh, studies in KSSTA, and I believe uh, from the Asia world in cadavers. Um, yeah, yeah. One was looking at forces, and one was looking at the medial lateral and the tracking. We, as well as Charles Rivier from Imperial College in London, have done 3D modeling of a thermal component designed for mechanical alignment placed in three-dimensional models with... Um, uh, KA and MA and looked at how closely we do or don't restore the morphology of the trochlea. Yeah. And it's shocking that even though the implants are designed for mechanical alignment, 
the results are pretty clear that you more closely match the native trochlea with a thermal component, whether it's next gen, uh, trike or tri- striker triathlon, Medacta, uh, Vanguard, um, and Persona more closely matches the native trochlea when you use KA than MA on the same femur. And you say, well, why is that? And one of the things we forget, but it's important to remember is, especially in the Asian population, at least 70% of your patients naturally have constitutional varus. So when you do mechanical alignment, all of those patients are placed at a neutral alignment, which puts the Q angle greater than what it was. So when you cut the femur in varus to where it was, and you end up changing the Q angle into a greater angle where KA keeps the native Q angle. So I think that's why we have seen a low incidence of patella tracking. It is not zero. And most of our cases were errors in my surgical technique, which I didn't understand because some femoral components are a bit more, how should we say, forgiving when you flex. So when we looked at our tracking problems, and Dr. Netapil, my partner, is on the paper, it took us, I don't know, seven years to get nine or 10 of them. But when we looked at them, they all had more flexion of the femoral component than what we would have liked. Some of those were due to PSI, where the patient-specific guide, you'd put it on, you'd jiggle it into position, you think it's right, but we had it flexed. So what happens is, on average, for every five degrees, you flex the femoral component from, if you will, the anatomic axis. You have to downsize the component by one. So if you flex 10 degrees and you were going to use a femoral component that fit the ML width, then the flange is sticking up like this. Yes. So now you got to drop down two sizes. But then what happens when you drop down two sizes, the cross-sectional area of the trochlea to capture patella is also smaller. That's where we saw the problem. And the curious thing was, when did it present? On average, at five months. And you can't pick it up when you passively move the knee. It becomes a dynamic thing where the patella is lateral when the knee's extended. And when the patient actively flexes it, it pops into the groove. It's out and extension pops into the groove. Out and extension pops into the groove. Why at five months? Because it takes that long. We resurface the patella in most of those knees with a dome. So the dome is relatively small with respect to the articular surface of the native patella. And over those five months, the soft tissue grows over the dome. And the dome is no longer convex. It becomes flat because of the soft tissue. So it doesn't get captured in the groove. So we found a lower incidence when we didn't reduce the patella. I mean, we didn't resurface the patella. But the problem was we had to go back on some of those and put a patella in. So I don't like to do the reoperation. And we all know infection rate and things go up higher when you reoperate for a patella issue. So I now resurface, but I use an anatomic button because it is a larger piece of plastic and it's harder for it to get overgrown by the plastic or by the soft tissue. Having said that, I do believe there's a role for a femoral component that is designed specifically for kinematic alignment. And it makes it real easy if all of us or whoever is in the catchment of kinematic alignment agrees to restore the patient's prearthritic joint line. Because when you're designing for MA, there's a surgeons that want to gap balance. Yes. Surgeons that want to externally rotate three degrees. And then you have the K person doesn't want to externally rotate at all. So when you're trying to design an implant to go to the gap balance guy or gal, where the femur is going to go way out like this, you've got to take away all this metal here so it doesn't overhang. And now you give it to the person that wants to go to three degrees and you get lateral uncoverage. And there was a nice paper from your country looking at the lateral uncoverage goes up as the thermal component gets put in more valgus to the mechanical angle. And that's because it's with MA, the thermal component is supposed to go the same place. But with KA, we're going to adjust it based on the patient's joint line. So with that, you can, and we, ha- we have in process, uh, we have redesigned, and it will be out for us to trial in the next month. We won't let it out for six months or so till we are, feel a little comfortable with it. But the, the trochlea will now, when you design for K, will cover better lateral, will not overcover medial, and you can make a bigger opening 
to capture that patella earlier in the flexion. And I think make it more robust. So if you have a technical error where you flex it a little bit, okay, the implant's more forgiving. <laughs> so anatomic button rather than a dome, uh, and then reduce the risk of flexing that femoral component. And I think any mechanically designed femoral component right now works pretty well with KA with those restrictions. Thank you. Is that what you wanted yeah. to hear? Yeah. Is that maybe, a little too maybe, long? Yeah, and maybe, maybe <laughs> this is a solution for uh, to uh, design design uh, uh, KA specific uh, specific uh, prosthesis. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but uh, I have uh, another question, uh, Professor How Howell. But uh, yeah, according to your theory, but maybe KA uh, technique is uh, uh, reasonable for all of this uh, 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 zero. But uh, I always worry about maybe just the, you do maybe the five degree or how many degree, how many, which degree is the right angle? Uh, how many meter is uh, is uh, appreciated as the uh, the thickness? But uh, I always worry about. That. But uh, maybe you can do a very accurate uh, the resection bone resections. But for another is not so good. But if you set the angle is uh, five degree, maybe he do this is uh, six and uh, the eight degree. So. I always wonder this is this kind of a situation. Yeah, so that, that 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 that's a very good point because when you're doing robot and nav, and when I did mechanical alignment, I was always thinking of the angle. Yeah, and now yeah. the angle I don't think about because my guide references the surface of the bone, so the angle is already set by just the guide being drilled on distally and compressed. If this is the distal femur, I have a distal referencing guide. And I bolt it to the medial lateral condyle with the offset. So when I do that, it's just like most people would use a posterior referencing guide and think that it's pretty accurate. All we did is add it to the distal surface. And then I'm the first to admit, we don't make all of our bone cuts perfect. You can make a bone cut three ways, just right, too yeah. much, or too little. But with our technique, it's rare unless I'm given the wrong guide to make an error more than about a millimeter or so. So let's say I make my distal medial cut. It's a varus knee. I want to get a six, but I cut a five. So if I cut a five, I have my distal referencing guide here. This is the medial side. I'll take out all the pins, but the one on this side, which allows me to move it this way, but it keeps it... Um, proximal distal, except for it allows me to pivot. And I'll pivot it out, and I'll use the saw blade as my caliper and just shave a millimeter more off to get it to the six. If I cut a seven instead of a six, or an eight instead of a six by mistake, let's say I was given the wrong guide and I over it. Then on the four and one block, when I put the four and one block on the end, on that condyle, I will put uh, on the block a two millimeter offset. And so when the 401 block goes on, it sits out. And then when I make my chamfer cuts, generally that will stay out and I'll fill it with cement. You may or may not be aware, but in 2006, uh, I had a co, uh, Charlie Chi, who is a, uh, parents were from China. His father was a um, aircraft uh, a fighter pilot and Charlie settled, centered, uh, settled in San Jose and he got a PhD in uh, robotics at UC Davis. And he worked with Bill Barger on the first robo doc way back then for putting in the total hip. So a few years passed and he hooked up with a guy named uh, uh, Ben, um, uh, uh, ben Park, who was from Korea. And he had a PhD in automated manufacturing from Berkeley. So the two of them were looking for someone to work with. They ended up with me, blah, blah, blah. Shorten the whole story. We decide we're going to do PSI for the total knee. So we used off-the-shelf software back in 2006 and developed, developed an algorithm for how to fit the femoral component to restore the joint surface. That was the start of KA. But planning with the software is not a simple process because you put the software on, we have the bone model or the cartilage model that we made at that time by an MRI of the knee. And then three-dimensionally, you put the implant on, and now you have to adjust six degrees of freedom. You have to adjust proximal distal, varus valgus, anterior, posterior, 
IE, flexion extension, and then ML you can do visually. So it's really five you have to do. But every time you change varus valgus, it also changes stuff back here and stuff up here. So you really have to go around the knee and it takes about 10 minutes to plan the position of the femoral component, which the robot software doesn't let you do. Plus, when you move the implant in the software, you got a movement of probably a millimeter degree. So you have stacked errors. The image is an error. The 3D model generated from the image produces an error. Not large, but an error. Then you have your planning. Huge variability when you let the implant rep do it for you. And even when you do it, unless you're doing thousands of them. And then you have a registration error when you're bringing the implant back or the instruments and register to the bone. And then you have an execution error. So when you look at the robot data by Rosa, and this is very important to note, Mako, as long as it's been out, has never published a paper on how much their planned distal and posterior femoral resections were missed when they executed the surgery. They can't publish that because they're not going to be accurate. They're going to be missing just like the Rosa. The Rosa, the first series had an over resection on average by half a millimeter. The second set of doctors were over by about seven or eight tenths of a millimeter. It's not much, but their standard deviation was 0.7 to 0.8 millimeters. So if you've got a deviation from target, let's say five tenths of a millimeter, and a standard deviation of 0.8, that means 0.5 plus or minus 0.6. So you could under resect by one millimeter as a, ma a maximum limit and over resect by two. That's why accuracy, there's not a number. It's this de deviation from the target, the mean difference, plus the precision or standard deviation from it. You want that to be zero plus or minus zero. And that's where I think the robot is going to work. I don't have any problems with doing it, but you better do what we do. I, I really wish, it's just too wordy. I really wish that when I came up with the term caliper kinematic alignment, I put the word check there. I thought about that this morning. It should say caliper checked kinematic alignment. Caliper checked. So whether you want to use PSI, you want to use the robot, you want to use NAV, you want to use your own instrument system, very good, fine. I'm happy that you're doing, Kay, because your patient's going to be happy. But please check the cut and have the little tricks we just talked about to move the implant back where it needs to be when we all make an error because a guide is a guide. It's not foolproof. Exactly. Okay, you know, every time uh, when I was confused or have some questions, ask for help from Dr. Hao, except uh, the detailed ex explanation. Every time Dr. Hao will give me some papers, publish the papers, some, some by himself, some by others. Uh, I'm surprised that every viewpoint from uh, Dr. Hao was supported by published paper. It's amazing. <laughs> so, well, I get, I, just as a response, that I get hit really hard in the U.S. You know, I, I want to tell you how thankful I am to be invited to your symposium, I, I have one with Korea in two weeks. I have yes. one in Bombay in two weeks. And let me tell you, how often do you think I'm invited by the Knee Society, by AUKUS, by the Joint Arthroplasty Surgeons in the U.S. to a meeting in the last 15 years? Maybe once or twice. <laughs> because the implant companies in the U.S. that run the business they don't have an answer for what we're doing. Yeah. Their implants aren't perfect. Their thought leaders aren't comfortable with the concept because they're getting paid on the royalties from their implants. And they're afraid if the implant goes in KA and they believe that varus loosening is going to be a problem and they really believe patella tracking is going to be a problem. And they give that implant to go down to Australia, New Zealand, and the UK where they have a registry. And they go then look at it at two years. Oh, the failure rate goes up. It'll ruin their knee. So the implant companies in the U.S., Depew, Zimmer, Stryker, they're very slow to take this concept on because their thought leaders that are in the revenue pool aren't anxious to do it. They're content where they are. And I was an, I'm an outsider. You know, I'm an, arth, I'm an arthroscopist, for goodness sake. I, I cut my teeth in the ACL world. But I learned back in 86, 7, and 8 that when I did ACLs, 
when I had an extension loss, I had the largest series in the world of serial MRI of the graft. And there it was. The first 23 that I did with hamstrings, 21 of them had the tibial tunnel to anterior and pinched on the roof. And then you'd see the graft swell on the MRI and you'd see the extension loss or the extension loss would go away with time and the ligament would be loose. So what was the cause of the problem? Surgeon, me, tunnel in the wrong place. Once we got that squared away, then we found that we had problems in the vertical range. The more vertical we put the tunnel, the more we got PCL impingement, which caused loss of flexion. And with time, the flexion may come back, but then the graft stretches and you get rotatory instability. So we discovered roof and PCL impingement. And consequently to that, then we looked back at total knee and we said, well, the whole problem we had primarily with ACLs is we didn't know where to put the graft. And then early on with soft tissues, we couldn't rehab it because we couldn't fix it. And when you go to total knee, you say, well, wait a minute, I can rehab it because I can fix it because I have cement. So if I can cement it and fix it and I can rehab it, then what's the reason it doesn't work like a total hip? It's in crooked. It's in crooked to the target. So what's the target? The target is the native joint line. And how did we get on to that? was in 2005 and six, we knew from our lab that there is this single axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. And we knew from Hollister's work in 1993, who found that axis for the first time. And we knew it from uh, Eckhoff's work and Joel Box, the second author, and that was our firm's former PhD student. We knew that there was an axis in the knee because our knee testing machine, we had to co-align our knee to that axis through an iterative process to do our testing. And we knew that that axis had nothing to do with the mechanical axis of the limb. In fact, the mechanical axis is sort of a goofy term because an axis means something moves around. It's really a mechanical angle. It's not an axis. It's an angle that we draw. And that's why really it has very little import into the longevity of the knee and the function of the knee because it's not a moving angle. It's a fixed angle. So, when we did PSI, we knew at the time we just had to MR the knee. We didn't need to look at the hip and the ankle. And in fact, when Stryker bought our company in 2009, they added the hip, they added the ankle in, which confused the issue. And that allowed blending to be done. And that's Simon Young's paper. He did not do unrestricted KA. His randomized trial was one in which they adjusted. He's a great guy. Let me tell you that. I have a huge admiration for him, but they were nervous down there. They did a lot of nav down there in New Zealand. And, you know, he's so they would adjust the angles within bounds. And the other thing they did that biased the study didn't, didn't make a, it's not studies, not a bad study. It's a great study. It just have to understand the biases. They limited the deformities that they were going to study. So they didn't put valgus in and they didn't put severe varus in. And then they restricted the correction. So there's a subset of those knees that didn't get corrected back to the patient's pre-arthritic joint line. Both of those things are biased in favor of MA because KA handles the severe deformities better than MA because we bring them back and we restore the joint lines, which balances the ligaments. So when you read the randomized trials, the only one that didn't restrict pre and post was Dawson, and that had the most glaring improvement. Callier had very good improvement, but two or three really bad knees with PSI because the guides floated. So uh, I'm very anxious to see if you guys, that is, you know, the, the colleagues in Asia, I mean, we're very indebted to Nikki and Matsumoto, who've done some, some good work looking at, you know, uh, MA versus KA, uh, you know, if there's going to be more of these randomized trials, but those of us that do KA philosophically and ethically, we have a hard time uh, going back and saying, we're going to randomize to MA. It's just hard to do. Okay. That's the story. Okay. Part of it. Okay. No. I understand. I understand your feeling and your expectation. Thank you, our three speakers, for today's contribution. Would you like to offer us some take-home message? Uh, I think uh, one by one from uh, Professor Zhang. This was a, a fantastic uh, discussion. I learned for so many uh, new informations. So thanks so, so much for uh, Professor Hao. Uh, Professor Wen and Professor Huang, I'm so honored to work with, uh, with, with us in particular. Who, uh, Professor Hall is the first surgeon who proposed the K, KA concept. So I have learned a lot of 
the from today's ANS. Thanks again for giving me such an amazing opportunity and I look forward to work with uh, you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zhang. Professor Huang, please give our some take-home message or suggestions. Uh, thank you, Professor Wen, and uh, thank you, Professor Zhu Hao and Professor Zhang. I'm so glad you and I'm so lucky to discuss with uh, Professor Hao and uh, Zhang and uh, Wen. I think maybe just like uh, Professor Zhang said, I learned more uh, from the uh, Professor Hao. Maybe I can. I, a, a little change my idea for the MA and the KA, but uh, maybe I have some <laughs> a little uh, questions for others. But uh, I think maybe just the, the conflicted with uh, others uh, 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 zero, and uh, I think we always use a different f uh, method to get the, the same target, just like a uh, professor. How said, I think maybe uh, in the future, maybe we can get uh, more and more information from the uh, 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 how. And I respect it for the Professor How's new book. It's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang. And the last turn to uh, Professor How. Please give us some uh, suggestions or comments. Well, Dr. Wen, you know, we first met when you were trying to go over, come over here. <laughs> and um, we were communicating, trying to get you here right when the virus started up. And uh, it didn't interfere at all with our ability to work together. Okay. And I want to thank you and the other speakers uh, for we don't have it right today. I'm not right. I'm better than I was 16 years ago. But the future is not me. The future is the four of you here today, or three of you here today, and all in the audience that are going to examine things, be critical, look at what we propose. And I think we're going to find many different techniques and ways to get the parts in. But I do believe that the concept of restoring the patient's prearthritic joint lines, just like the hip arthroplasty surgeon, wants to restore the hip center, wants to restore the offset, wants to restore the version. We should use the same principles we use in every other joint replacement until the arthroplasty and restore the patient's prearthritic joint surfaces. And I think that with that as a foundation, we move from there. And you're going to examine that foundation again, but I think that's going to be pretty solid. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to share what we've learned in 16 years. And as a final thought, as I've gotten discouraged over the years, trying to get the concept out. I feel that it's gaining a lot of traction because of this type of symposium that you're having. And when you look up in the internet, how long does it take for a paradigm change? The numbers vary, but it's between 17 and 20 years from onset of the concept. So we're 16 years into it and maybe four more years ago to go before the paradigm will change. And Max Planck, the famous physicist, when they were looking at relativity versus classic physics, same sort of thing, not at the same level, of course, but K versus MA, he said, it takes about 20 years for the change. And the way it happens is the old guys die off. So the old guard, you have to allow the fresh thoughts to come in. So I encourage the department chairmen, where they are, to let their younger protégés keep a watch on them, give them guidance, give them direction. But as they want to expand their thoughts and everything, allow them to make themselves better than you. A good department chairman is not trying to keep their younger people's ideas down. They want them to be 10 years, 20 years later, better than them. Just like as a parent, you want your child to be better than you. Give them that opportunity. Let them think freely, but keep a watch on them as they move and make sure they do things well. So thank you for your time. And I'm always happy to do this kind of discussion. It really fulfills me. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Thank you for your sincere words and earnest wishes. Good. Okay, thank you very much indeed again, our lecturers and the audience. At last, I would like to thank uh, Astroplasty Society in Asia for providing us the opportunity to participate in this online seminar. We had a very nice discussion we've got lots of inspiration from each other. 
Current limitation in total neosoplasty and patient satisfaction should stimulate us to question our practice. Implant design and surgical technique need to be advanced to better reproduce the anatomy and the kinematics of native knees and ultimately provide a forgotten joint. Okay, everyone, let's go with the day. Thanks for watching. Hope you all will enjoy yourself. We will see you next time.